Hey everybody, Tactic Angel, back on the PlayStation 5 to run down the history of USS San Diego, which appears in World of Warships Legends as a Tier 7 Premium Cruiser. My review of San Diego should follow shortly, and once it is available, you should see a link to it in the description. The USS San Diego was the third of the four original Atlanta-class light cruisers, and of eight of the overall class when counting the Oaklands. When she was launched, she would be just another warship in a troubled class, but a few years later, USS San Diego would go on to become one of the most decorated warships in US history. I talk a bit more about the Atlanta-class cruisers in my Atlanta review, but the very short story is that these ships were originally envisioned to be flotilla leaders alongside destroyers, operating more or less in place of what the US Navy had hoped the Omaha class could do decades earlier. That role never fully materialized, and if the loss of the first two Atlantas in the night fighting off of Savo Island was any indication, they might not have had the staying power for it. But armed to the teeth with dual-purpose 5-inch guns, and even more AA on top of that, they found another role which was arguably more vital in the first naval war fought largely through projecting air power. Laid down in March 1940, the USS San Diego launched in July 1941 and entered service in January 1942. She'd have her shakedown crews around Chesapeake Bay off the coast of Maryland, but otherwise spent her entire service history in the Pacific, first stopping off at her namesake city, then heading out at best speed with USS Saratoga by her side in an attempt to get another flat top into the battle order before the Japanese attack on Midway. She would arrive just a bit too late to participate and then sail towards Pearl Harbor. From there, her first assignment was to escort the original USS Hornet as the fleet steamed towards the Solomons. She was present for the sinking of USS Wasp on September 15th before unfortunately having to watch her own carrier take damage five weeks later on October 26th. Situated on Hornet's port side, there was little that she could do to fend off the attack that came from her starboard. Hornet would take three bomb hits, two torpedo hits, and then was deliberately hit by a Japanese Val. San Diego was able to take down three of the attacking aircraft, but with a superior Japanese fleet in pursuit, the carrier was deemed unsavable. USS San Diego would participate, therefore, in the evacuation of personnel, taking aboard around 200 sailors from Hornet before the USN curiously tried and failed to scuttle the doomed carrier. Transferred to escorting USS Enterprise when she returned to combat duty on November 11th, San Diego was at least partly responsible for keeping what was then the only operational US carrier in the Pacific above the waves. San Diego would support the carrier and provide valuable AA during the naval battle of Guadalcanal November 12th through 15th allowing Enterprise aviators to aid in the sinking of battleship Hai and an additional 18 IJN ships. San Diego took no damage in the battle, though this is the battle where two of her sister ships, Atlanta and Juno, were both lost in desperate nighttime engagements. San Diego would stay around the Solomons until February 1943, before retiring to Auckland, New Zealand, for some well-earned R&R. In July 1943, San Diego's quest to see if she couldn't meet just about every fleet carrier in the Pacific continued when she joined up with USS Saratoga and HMS Victorious, as well as the light carrier USS Princeton, in support of landings in Munda, New Georgia, and Bougainville, then raids against Rabul. Ultimately unsuccessful at taking Rabul, which would remain in Japanese hands until the end of the war, the island was effectively bombed and shelled into irrelevance before the Navy moved on to Tarawa. By now, if you were on the San Diego, you'd have witnessed the war effort in the Pacific move from a scrappy defense of carriers with three cruisers and a handful of destroyers at the Solomons to a task force that consists of no fewer than five carriers and 200 additional ships in support of the U.S. 2nd Marine Division's assault on the island. From Tarawa, San Diego met up with USS Lexington for the Kwajalein raid, helping to repel attacks against Lady Lex from the sky. She scored at least two AA kills. Unfortunately, the attacking aircraft had illuminated Lexington with flares, allowing a submarine to score a torpedo hit. Though this would be the first of several times the Japanese would have claimed to sink CV-16, temporary repairs were made and San Diego escorted her back to Pearl Harbor before continuing herself to San Francisco for refit. 
It's at this point that our original Chicago Piano AA guns were removed and replaced by the legendary 40mm Bofors, and she also got the first of two upgrades to her radar, which we'll try not to talk about. But the appearance of this ship in-game approximates her appearance when she took to sea again, complete with this reproduction of the Measure 33-24D, which she would wear throughout the rest of the war, and it's mostly accurate if you overlook the turrets. When she returned to duty in January 1944, she'd end up assigned to Mark Mitcher's Fast Carrier Task Force, alternatively named Task Force 58 and Task Force 38, whether operating with the 5th or 3rd Fleet, respectively. This was where San Diego would remain almost to the end of the war in support of an ever-growing mob of U.S. carriers. Task Force 58 sailed first for Majuro and then for the Marshall Islands as part of the island hopping strategy taking Allied forces ever closer to the Japanese home islands. From there, Task Force 58 moved on to the opening salvos against Truck Atoll, a natural deep water port that Japan had used as a forward operating base for their navy. Though no attempt was ever made to take the atoll, constant raids and the dropping of aerial mines would increasingly diminish the IJN's ability to operate far from their home waters. After another upgrade to her radar in April 1944, she'd rejoin Task Force 58. Though ordinarily as a cruiser, her position would have been towards the outside of the large circular formations emanating from carriers, then to battleships, cruisers, and then a destroyer screen. Due to her powerful radar, San Diego often found herself in a more central location with the most valuable carriers where she could assist in directing air defense. That position may seem like one where it isn't quite as interesting to talk about her, because by now the Fast Carrier Task Force would have consisted of dozens and dozens of ships, and the opportunity for individual glory wasn't quite there as this indomitable force raffle stomped its way around the Pacific against increasingly outnumbered Japanese forces. You'd be somewhat correct, with San Diego sailing for Wake Island, then Marcus Island, and then to Saipan where the task force participated in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, more famously known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Then it was on to Guam and the Palau Islands, Manila Bay, and finally the first strikes against Okinawa and Formosa, modern day Taiwan. The defending forces of Formosa were reminded of San Diego's capable AA as she scored two additional aerial kills here and drove off the remainder of a squad of Japanese Kate torpedo bombers. Though San Diego made it out untouched, USS Houston and USS Canberra, both named for ships previously sunk in the war, were also both damaged. And this would give the ship a brief trip to Lithia Island alongside the two damaged ships and USS Wichita which had the American Canberra in tow. She was again with the Fast Carrier Task Force in time to get hit by Typhoon Cobra and was able to continue on to Indochina, revisit Formosa, and then to Iwo Jima. She scored additional aerial kills against Japanese attack aircraft based out of Hyushi in southern Japan. Operating close to Japan gave her the rare opportunity for shore bombardment duty against Minami Daitojima, but it was not without its danger. On April 11th, San Diego assisted the USS Haggard Fletcher-class destroyer that had been hit by a kamikaze attack, and treated 31 of her seriously injured crew members, and continuing in the region, added at least two more kills to her count later that month. After a short stint for maintenance, she'd serve with the Fast Carrier Task Force until the end of hostilities on July 10th, after which she was finally transferred into Task Force 31. Task Force 31 is an interesting one because though there were many TFs that use this number, the one we're talking about exists for only around two weeks. Placed under the command of Rear Admiral Oscar Badger, Bull Halsey designated San Diego as Task Force Flagship, in honor of the ship's service history. You can find a number of ships that claim pride of place as the first ship into Tokyo Bay. Part of this is what day they're talking about but technically it was a U.S. minesweeper for purely practical reasons, since Japan had the time to demine the entry to the harbor themselves, and I'm sure it was a total coincidence that that ship's name was USS Revenge. Then there were a series of destroyers with exceptional service histories, but what is less arguable is that at 9 a.m. on August 28th, USS San Diego was the first major surface vessel to enter and flagship of the task force intended to accept the surrender of the Japanese Empire. The task force had the official duty of securing the harbor, but obviously it was among the hundreds and thousands who watched the end of the largest and most destructive war in human history come to a close on the deck of Battleship Missouri a few days later. 
In total, during World War II, the San Diego steamed over 300,000 miles, engaged the enemy on 34 occasions, and never lost a man. She earned 18 battle stars for her service, second only to the legendary carrier USS Enterprise, which had 20. From there, like pretty much any other ship with space, she participated in Operation Magic Carpet. Following the war, she'd spend almost 15 years in the reserve fleet. During that time, the U.S. Navy started to move away from the two-letter class designations, and she was redesignated CLAA-53 for Light AA Cruiser. San Diego was finally struck from the Naval Register on March 1959, and unfortunately would be sold for scrap a year later in February 1960. She was broken up later that year in December of that same year, and it's only a shame that her namesake isn't a port city or anything. In any case, that pretty much finishes off the history of the San Diego. Once again, please check out my review of the ship once it's available below. Hope you've enjoyed the video, and I'll see you on the next one.